Hi everyone, I'm James. Um, I'll be teaching this class on designing with complex geometry. Um, it will be based in Grasshopper, which is a sort of part of Rhino. And uh, my background's in architecture, and I've sort of used Grasshopper for well over a decade and Rhino as well. And I'll explain sort of, uh, through a slideshow first, kind of go over some of the concepts of advanced geometry, how they can came into architecture and why now they're kind of being exported into other fields, um, the way architects use the geometry. And um, then we'll do some examples in Grasshopper. I'll show you kind of how to use the software for the first time. And then have some Q&A time where you can share your screen and ask any questions and make sure that you know how to use the tools correctly. And then we'll do another example um, and do another Q&A and that would be uh, this first week's class. So I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, and jump over to the slides. So I thought we'd start just um, with curves and the history of, of the curve itself. And um, for, the, for a very long time, many centuries, that this idea of uh, a curve made out of composition of circles and uh, lines sort of dominated how people thought about uh, building and designing objects. So you can kind of see in this example, like by Glenn, just this, um, the, the arcs of the circles make the curve and there's nothing in this um, curve other than the arcs of circles and straight lines. And when we look at any sort of uh, sacred geometry, that sort of cathedrals, mosques, synagogues um, that are uh, a couple hundred years old, that a lot of them can look quite complex. But when you look at them closely, you can sort of recognize that everything can be made with a compass and a ruler. That it's all just circles cutting into other circles, forming triangles, using the sort of center points of the new circle, and and going from there. But it's all sort of just a range of this sort of very basic geometry, even these um, corners in, in um, mosque in Iran, that you have the circular arc and the straight line, and you, you produce these really complicated geometries, but with very basic inputs. The spline, again, this is from Greg Lynn, uh, the spline was quite different. It allowed for a much smoother continuous curve, which had weights and points to control the geometries, the, uh, the beginnings of the computational curve, which was built on top of the spline. So when we look at those two together, that you can see this one produces a smoothness that is not produced on the older type of compositional curve. These curves got their start in uh, the 1950s um, when two car companies in France were competing with each other. So you had Citron, um, who came up with the, the first piece line, basis line, and uh, Renault, who, because Citron were very secretive, so Renault, uh, Cabezzi, and Renault uh, tried to kind of come up with something similar, but came up with something quite different called the Bezier curve. And um, they sort of formed two sort of main types of curves. GM would bring that further uh, with a, a non uniform piece line and then going further again, the non uniform rational piece line, and then got sick of saying that in full and just started calling it nerves. So you kind of see that these curves were first used by car companies and uh, airliners and uh, NASA to describe geometry to communicate with machines because they were looking for these kind of uh, beyond standard parts. The Bezier curve really took its hold in graphic design and fonts. You kind of see Google's font here uh, was first done with Bezier curves and had a relatively high file size. And your choice in, in geometry, which then influences design, can result in much uh, lower file sizes, which in the case of Google, this logo is loaded so many trillions of times a day that the file size is quite important to uh, reduce energy consumption of power plants and everything else. Uh, another big uh, uh, sort of innovator within geometry is uh, Pixar, who uh, the CEO um, who wrote the book created the Inc. Catmull, um, he kind of did his PhD on subdivision surfaces, which is another branch of geometry. 
um, and it runs that way. So from a computation perspective, the uh, cellular automata is one form of a sort of recipe where you start with basic inputs and computations used to create complexity from those inputs. And these are sort of uh, a very old or decades old type of recipe that is quite common now that everyone sort of tries out as, as a sort of introduction to computation to create their own game of life, which was done in the 1970s. And uh, another one, the L systems. And these kind of are kind of like recipes and grasshopper components or grasshopper definitions is the name of the file. It's kind of like a recipe as well. And we're kind of going to go through uh, a bunch of recipes that you're going to uh, recreate yourself and um, kind of just learn the basics. And only kind of after the course will you start composing things that might be unique in the same way that a sort of chef might learn how to cook through recipes first and eventually get to know the, the sort of base ingredients so well that they, they can compose their own recipes. This is a just an example um, of an architecture project created with L systems. So it uses the same, um, this, this basically uses a, the initial branch and then just replicates, repeating that as many times as uh, it's told to uh, at a certain angle. And this uses the same logic using a base component and then grows a uh, building from the initial inputs. So the first um, architectural project, uh, I'm just going to go through some architectural projects that sort of show my background in this and where, where the, that field kind of comes into geometry. So the first uh, architectural project that really some people think is a, a sort of digital uh, project is the Google and the Bao. And the reason is because the software at the time was not uh, capable of building this building. And the French aerospace company Dassault Systems had come up with a software that they had no use for. And Frank Gary went and sort of said, I have a use for your software. I need to build this building. The software in my industry doesn't work for this. So they kind of collaborated and came up with their own um, software called Digital Project to create this project. And construction workers similarly said they would refuse to build this building. So shipbuilders were said, we're okay with building curves. And it was the sort of a, a beginning of, of, of complicated components. Uh, arriving on site, being scanned with a barcode and placed into very specific positions, which is very different from traditional building sites. Uh, Yokohama Port Terminal is another uh, project that would be quite difficult to create without kind of advanced CAD. Um, in this case, you have this uh, sort of shifting landscape, uh, kind of going up and down, where you're, you're kind of at this point, you kind of go up these steps and be on the top or go underneath. and the sort of plan section elevation traditionally used to describe buildings or objects or anything like that would just be quite difficult. So in this case, uh, if you remember the contour command from the last uh, lecture, they just produced lots and lots of sections and then that produced all the trusses, which were all slightly different, and that went on site and they constructed the project. Uh, another uh, uh, project is uh, by Greg Lynn, who did the curves uh, in the first part of the lecture the embryological house, which um, is kind of a conceptual project, but uh, described uh, 50,000 uh, variations uh, of a house from uh, the same number of components. And it was uh, a kind of conceptual proposal that uh, using computation and the design process meant, uh, as well as sort of machines that would, CNC machines that would digitally create the parts, meant there was no need to have a sort of mass standard uh, system anymore, we could move to a mass customized uh, custom standard. This is sort of a, a model of a, a proposed channel. Uh, another form of variation is uh, kinetic structures, and this is the hyposurface, which this whole wall uh, sort of moves um, as, you, as you kind of get near it, and uh, by decoy architects and the team. And an example of uh, a sort of moving structure uh, that's built that you can visit if you're in Paris is the Institut de Mondard by Jean Nouvel. And it basically has all these metal components that move throughout the day. And this uh, structure is repeated for the whole facade. And you can kind of just walk in and go up the stairs and look out from the inside. And then there's the sort of complexity that can be generated through computation. So this is Galaxia by Burning Man by Arthur Manimani, who was my first grasshopper uh, tutor. And um, this is a project he created 
um, where he got married at, and we'll look at in, in his course later. So these are three reasons or three types of projects that are probably uh, at least variation and complexity being two of the most common of the reasons that you might pick up a sort of computational design software is to have many objects where there's a lot of variation between all of those objects because there's a, a, um, a model that has uh, parametric controls. You can alter the parameters when you're doing the output or just to generate a lot of complexity very fast. And then kinetic structures is, um, I guess, a possibility. Um, some of the other reasons uh, that architects are less likely to do, engineers are more likely to do, maybe, um, that you can do in Grasshopper is optimization. So this is an example of a human designed uh, node on the left and given to uh, an evolution solver that tries as many, to make 20 times to make it more efficient. And then out of those 20, tries to do 20 better versions of them. And then just keeps going until uh, you make it stop to um, to make a lighter. So the idea was to get some sort of metal node that would hold fires and have enough weight and structure to, to support them. And the uh, done by our engineers, this is a much lighter node that I don't think any human would design um, uh, normally, but you give it its sort of inputs and, and its desired output, and it sort of optimizes for that output and sort of try to create the lightest, strongest uh, node that still allows the, the five wires to go through. And you can do that in Grasshopper through uh, sort of plugin Galapagos. And another uh, type of geometry is sort of tension uh, or tensile structures that um, disappeared from architecture from a long time because they're really hard to draw and uh, sort of came back in the 1960s. And um, this is a sort of uh, a shrink wrap skin on top of a uh, metal frame that was flipped uh, in multiple directions that had uh, a different floor each time for different art exhibitions and different thing by Bellamy. And that sort of uh, is part of the Kangaroo 2 plugin, which is the physics engine that we're going to look at in the last week. So some of uh, just an example of um, kind of working with complexity. This is from uh, master students in London at the Architectural Association to Design Research Lab, and they sort of take all these inputs, generate the geometry, and, and then build that up into a sort of big model of different towers. And their whole project is online at shampoo.net if you want to see more photos of it. So one of the places a lot of people from the master program go to work is the Hadid Architects, who's uh, most famous for building a lot of these complex geometry uh, projects. Um, just having more, well, there's different people around the world who have proposed a lot of these uh, projects and, and done really cool renders and, and, and uh, images of projects and, and models. But actually getting the projects built, I think that to be is sort of well ahead of everyone else. And one of the problems they run into is a lot of these projects are over budget and very, very expensive. So um, a different direction is um, to use a standard component like a brick and produce variation in Grasshopper or the other software. And this is the work of Clemente Cochler and ETH in Zurich. And they're just uh, taking a brick on the left here and using a uh, six axis robot to pick and place them at very specific angles. And on this case, you can kind of might be able to see these little drones that were uh, carrying the bricks and placing them at very specific angles on top of each other. And this idea is, I, I just watched a lecture recently and I just thought I'd include it on discrete architecture. So a brick being a sort of discrete element that is not uh, a column or a floor or a wall that can build any of those uh, types. And constructing a, a, a more complicated discrete element, so standard one component, and then putting that on a, a building site where that one component is added together to be a, a, a pavilion or a building in front of a bigger scale where its assembly determines whether its position determines whether it's in the floor, the column, the, the, the ceiling, and so on. And he sort of uh, uh, compared to Greg Lynn curves to his own sort of discrete curve. And that sort of the idea of reducing the cost but still producing complexity as a sort of primary goal. 
So um, the in Rhino, the um, main uh, categories of geometry that you use uh, are different from if you have a background in SolidWorks. In solids, you probably work with solids first. In, in surface geometry, uh, at least we kind of work with points and curves first and then generate surfaces from those curves and then generate poly surfaces, which are, if they're closed, become solids. So it, it's very much curve centric in terms of generating the geometry as opposed to starting with the solid and getting going from there. In Grasshopper, they're slightly different um, on the, the last few. So we're still going to work with points, curves, and surfaces. But uh, rather than call a collection of surfaces a polysurface, we're just going to call it a BRAP, which stands for uh, boundary representation. And um, other than that, it's, it's kind of the same. It sort of can include more information within its um, unit, but we're just going to use it as a polysurface within this course. So. And then the other types of uh, surface geometry are mesh and subdivision. And basically, nerves have a background being used in anything that needs to be built in the real world. If they're very precise, um, they allow you to do curved lines between polygonal points set in, in space. The opposite, or kind of a different type of geometry, is mesh geometry, polygonal geometry, where you have points set in 3D space, straight lines between them, no map. Uh, defining those curves. They're just points and straight lines. And you can have a low poly sphere or a high poly sphere. But moving these points can be quite difficult. You need a different set of uh, softwares to do that. Um, the lower number of curves or lower number of components you have in any 3D model makes it easier to edit. So that led to subdivision, which um, goes back to Ed Catmull's PhD. Uh, the CEO of Pixar to have um, a different type of geometry that we covered a bit in the last course, but it's it's the idea of having a lot of geometry on one side or one face and less geometry on the other side. So you can sort of, if you were doing a human face, that you'd want a lot more geometry where the mouth and the nose and the eyes are than the back of the head. And you can kind of adjust that way. And these different types of geometry are used to do different things. So in, in our last round of course, we did a cat with subdivision. With the count I drew and uh, subdivision geometry and, met, and polygonal geometry is used to do a lot of smooth things, a lot of sort of what's called soft geometry, where nerves is very precise, very accurate uh, geometry. And now we're going to uh, move into Grasshopper and do our first example. And I'm just going to keep it as uh, not too complicated geometry, but just to kind of get us that we start to use sliders for the first time and components. Um, so this is my hometown, Dublin, Ireland, and um, this is Haveny Bridge, which was used to cost half a penny to cross. We're going to draw that in in Grasshopper. And if you just keep looking at the screen until I'm done so that you see everything that's going on, and then we'll sort of, um, you can do open the software yourself and start doing this example. And I'll be available for anyone to share their screen, answer any questions, and do that. So. So I've um, created this file that you can have a look at uh, later tonight or, or, or during the week. And I'm going to share a lot of these Grasshopper files on the Hackaday U uh, project site. So um, this is our software. Um, we have, um, when you open it for the first time, uh, this will be closed. When you open it for the first time, you'll have to choose a unit type. Um, it doesn't really matter what units you choose. Uh, the software is just going to think in numbers of 0, 1, 100, 1,000. If you set it as millimeters when you first launch it, it's going to be millimeters. If you set it for light years, it's going to be light years. But for most of the sports, it doesn't really matter because it's just numbers. And uh, you type in Rhino in this top corner. You can type commands. You can use icons. You can use these menus from the top. Um, if you type grasshopper here, that gets grasshopper open. And we're going to do most of our uh, project inside of grasshopper. Um, only thing you might need to know is to double click these uh, top front perspective to enlarge those parts of the screen. And um, sorry, I'm having trouble with this 
too many in a way. But I could just, um, the only thing right around the time might need to know is double click these uh, titles to get um, them enlarged. And then um, I'm going to right click to sort of orbit around your model. Um, zoom, if you have a quick little mouse, it's great to sort of just roll the mouse forward and back. Otherwise, you can use two fingers on a laptop and slide in and out. And if you hold shift and right click, you can pan, uh, which is to sort of put it that way. Slightly different on all the other views that are two dimensional, where right click is the pan and zoom is the same. So we'll um, double click on perspective view, and I'm going to put my grasshopper window as half the screen. To open a, a new file, so if you download the file later, you can sort of go file. Open document, confirm the file, and, and put it in. Grasshopper files have a .gh uh, extension where uh, Rhino files have a .3dn, and they're saved as different files. And um, in that sense, you have to make a choice whether the information you create is in your Grasshopper file or in your Rhino file. Inside of Grasshopper, to um, the easiest way to get commands is to double click, double left click. And gets enter a search word, and you just type the command, and it's it's got a lot of predictions, so it sort of guesses what you're looking for. And if I want to do a point, I just type point, and there I get my point component. Of course, you got these menus at the top. Um, let's enlarge this a bit. Um, you have these menus at the top. They have um, these categories uh, first, and you kind of go through different menu sets: curves, surfaces, meshes, and so on. And that's one way of um, finding uh, everything. And it's good to sort of just browse serendipitously, browse and try to find different components to work with. So um, these are our main types, as I mentioned. And when they are have nothing inside of the, the component, they appear orange. And if you double click these menus, it might be red if it's not working. But if you either highlight over it or double click it, it will sort of tell you that it's not collecting any data because it's sort of empty. And you can kind of select and delete things as well. And if you right click, you'll see a range of options. And set one point will um, allow you to uh, set a point in Rhino. And you have two options on how to do it. It's quite significant which one you do. So in this case, it's looking for a coordinate, and it wants me to type the coordinate in Rhino. So if I type 0, 0, 0, that's x, y, and z, um, it will sort of go to the origin, and then I type enter, and that will create that point. And you see this now is, is gray. And a coordinate is saved into the grasshopper file, so that's um, sort of saved there. If I was to create a point in grasshopper, which just means this icon and point, and I did set one point, and I can change it here in this topping from type coordinate to type point. It allows me to select the point there. And now that point is in, in Rhino, but is referenced in Grasshopper. And I can sort of move the point. Normally, that's the right. Oh, I have a preview turned off. So, when it, when something's referenced in Grasshopper, um, it will be red. So, you have this red X, and um, lines will appear red. If they're in Rhino, though, you can kind of color them different colors. So, they're generally black. So, um, as our first example, um, you can sort of download this example or create it. Um, you can kind of double click and uh, do a rectangle. And we're going to basically just hold down the left click and, and move a slider into the left side of these components. And the left side is inputs, the right side is outputs. 
um, as you can't loop around and self-reference itself. But we're basically going to use sliders, move them into a number. So I'm going to make that the x and y both reference to the slider. And I need a point as well. So um, and now the third way to create a point, and probably the fastest way to create a point, is just to double click and type uh, any number by a comma, any number by a comma, by any number. And it automatically knows that format of number, comma, number, comma, number as a point. And it'll just be a point that's already referenced. So I don't need to do the like click and set one point. I can just go straight there. So now that rectangle appears in our in our window as um, there and I guess a little rhino trick sometimes uh, window is not calibrated so if you take an object and zoom on that object by typing uh, um, by typing Z for zoom uh, all views or kind of clicking this all views or typing A and uh, I just select the extents, I can select the book paper. And now my window will rotate or sort of orbit on that object or on that area. So um, with this rectangle, I can um, I can have these uh, instructions for later that you're going to take this uh, and move it to the curve. And that will divide it by a number. And then we'll hit the slider into that number. So that's again another input. And as we move that slider, you can see on the left here that um, the number of division points is changing very fast on here. And if I uh, if I was to use a surface command, um, I can sort of drag the R rectangle into the surface, and now it's going to make that a surface, which is highlighted red. And the surface into a, a surface like mine. I'll show you these commands. I'm just going to show you kind of what Rhino does. And the U and V is uh, the uh, kind of like the X and Y of a surface. Um, they represent the isotherm. So I can drag a number into both of them and, and move that number around to a lower number and see that represented on the surface. So that's just the, the first exercise um, getting to this. As um, kind of the same, but a little bit different. Um, I can sort of uh, select components and do Control Q to turn them off or turn off the preview. They're still um, calculating in Grasshopper, so it might be useful to uh, disable them, which would be Control E. Uh, if you if if they were a slow nine computer, these ones are very basic. So I'm going to do that. And uh, for this uh, second uh, example, we're just going to create uh, two lines and and uh, uh, control them. So we have uh, a point at zero zero zero, and rather than there's there's no really copy and paste in in Grasshopper. It's more move point or scale point or move object rotate scale. So we're going to use a, a move component and uh, connect the point to the move component. And then if we uh, highlight over any of these inputs on the left, we can see what this component is looking for. So we can see this is looking for a vector. And I've got this unit x vector. So I can say on the x vector and how much. On the x is 100. So, I'm to make sure that's preview. Uh, so, control Q to make sure that's on as a preview. And there's my points. Now, I've moved a point and I can use the slider to move the point left and right up to 100 units. And if I created a bigger slider, it would be. Uh, and then I can create a line because there's, there's no there's no line geometry there. There's just two points: the, the move point stuff so here and the original point stuff so here. So I can drag that one to a line component A and B, and Control Q turn it off. Um, and there's my line component. 
And now the line component can be brought into a divide component. And uh, that's by default divided 10 times. And now that can be divided uh, whatever number of times on this slider. So you can see there that it is nine divisions. And if I move this original slider, it's going to change the, the overall extent. And if I was to create a cone command, double click and just type cone, okay, basic, I'm going to put on all the points of the division. So you can see here when you left click, kind of hover over the uh, P, that there's 10 points there. And if I change this number, there would be more. Um, so let's keep it low for a moment. So on all the points, create a cone. And for the radius of the cone, let's just pick the slide of the individual radius. And for the height. So you can kind of see there that now we have a cone on all the points, and all of these can be if, if I change this slider, I'm changing the number of points and simultaneously changing the radius and the length of all the points. So one way of doing this uh, neater is to say whatever the distance is, which we know is this number. Um, and so I can do a division component. And okay, this overall length divided by whatever number of division points we have as the radius. And yeah, we know that. Is going to go so now all the cones are still too big, um, but the, the radius is um, the total length divided by the number of points. So if I divide that by two, because radius, so I can um, type backslash two as a fast way of uh, creating the division component, but sort of having a default set to whatever numbers after the backslash. And uh, I can drag this component in here. And now put that as the radius. And now I have whatever number of points will automatically create cones. You can see how this line gets there that way. And then just as a last sort of introductory example, um, Actually, I think I'll just skip onto the bridge. Actually. So to to draw a, a bridge from scratch, um, I'm going to double click and type point, and um, I could set one point. Actually, sorry, I'll double click and type zero comma zero dot comma zero, and that creates my first point. And move. And a nice fast way of creating a big slider. Um, so if I type uh, just a number by itself, it will just automatically create a slider with that number. And if I create a slider, if I type a number between uh, zero and ten, I will get a slider that with the minimum max that has zero to ten. If it's between ten and one hundred, it will kind of create a slider between those two numbers. So if I want a, a sort of really big slider, um, if I type 200, it will be a slider of 300. It will be a slider between 0 and 1,000. So I need a, a vector, a direction. So on the unit x, so I have unit x for, for the x direction, and then the slider goes in there for the distance. And with each of these uh, sliders, um, I can sort of right click and rename them. And this is going to be the bridge length. And um, I'm going to create um, division points on that line. So I'm going to do divide by um, pick five. And sorry, divide curve. So 
just like do a line from our point to our second point, and then divide that curve, and then um, we can do a, a small slider. And sometimes, um, because zero is the starting point of a lot of um, series of numbers in any kind of um, programming. So sometimes when you uh, think you have four, you actually have five, and you need to watch whether the starting number of any series is zero or one. So I want, um, I'm gonna do four, so that gives me five minutes. And um, I can use the uh, list item command, uh, which is one that we're going to use very often. So in this point list, we have uh, five points. And if I put it in here, I can, this, this is whatever number I select on the, um, so by selecting an item, it appears green in this perspective view. And if I was to uh, create a slider and put it into I, this is the, the item index, the number that I'm, doing, I'm selecting. And so if I have this selected and I move this, I can see that point zero is uh, the point on the left, point one is the next one, two, three, two, four is the last one. So if I zoom in and I see this plus, I can kind of get um, these uh, different uh, out, sort of outputs which are going to be each of those points. So now I want to move, um, let's say, this second point. And I want to move the third point. Uh, or just move the each of them. I want to move them in the z direction. And I want a slider for each of them. Um, let's do for, you know. so I connect the slider to the vector and the vector to the vector. So three different numbers here. Then there's two in control C and control V to copy and paste. So they were both of you see them on the screen. So now I'm going to use a NURBS curve by typing NURBS curve, and I want to get the, the points that are going to construct my, my curve into this V here. So um, this is the most left point uh, at the bottom when I've been placed uh, vertically, and that goes uh, in there. And currently, they can't construct a, a, a curve with just one point, so it's red. And to put more than one input into the same uh, input, I hold down the shift key, because if I do this at first, it will just replace it without holding any buttons. So um, if I hold the shift key and uh, drag it in there, it will drag in another second point, and a third point, and a fourth point, and then this one, this end point here is our last point. So um, now we have these uh, three sliders to control the height of um, these middle points. So this is sort of the, the middle part of the bridge. And then these are two sides. So we can kind of control that. So we're not do it, we're, we're keeping both the, the start and the end on the end. And uh, to get rid of these points, just to because they're distracting, I can just select them all and Control Q, so that they're okay. So 
Now I have this um, nerves curve and I can divide um, that curve. And do one choice the slider or right here. And we can sort of put um, a bunch of uh, vertical lines. I'm probably going to do this slightly simpler because I'm using more time than I thought I would. Um, do uh, vertical lines on top of uh, this curve. So to do that, I want to move all these points uh, vertically. So I can take the P of the digital curve. And currently, that's the number, whatever this slider is. And uh, that's currently um, going in a sort of vector 10, but we want to control it. So we want the unit z direction. So we type unit, I sometimes say z or z for the unit name. And we can run the So this component record represents all those moved um, uh, points. This one represents the ones on the bottom. So we can do a line, do geometry, bottom point, or the top point, bottom point. And now we have um, vertical lines on, um, on top of our bridge. I can go back to any of these um, sliders and edit them. I'm going to turn these points off and these points off. And I'm just going to um, say, if I type uh, geometry, and this is going to be a catch all for the geometry that we created and put these lines into this geometry and this curve. So we're going to hold down shift. So we'll put two things into the same in the container. And then we're going to move that geometry that by default is putting on the unit that there. I'm going to move it in unit Y, which is this way and create another slider. Then I have the, the other side of the bridge. And um, if I want to create much more geometry, I just put it all into the geometry, uh, into this sort of uh, geometry component. And then it will always copy whatever is going into here. And I'm just going to also extrude um, this curve, which will be my basic bridge. I'm going to take that surface and extrude it by the same vector. I don't need to actually recreate it. And, and there's a sort of basic bridge. And I can do another nerve curve because they're just points. All those points to make a curve that makes the curve there and put that into our geometry and it cuts this curve there. So there's our, our basic bridge, and I'll probably stop there and let everyone open the screen and see if you can create that. It's sort of um, the beginnings of um, creating a parametric model with all those sliders. Um, hopefully, everyone got. The first example done. Um, I'm going to post a quiz that if anyone wants to answer, it'd be great. Just has like a few questions and it will remind some of the lessons. I, I'm going to change it slightly from what I had because um, I'll edit it and then I'll post it again. But definitely keep an eye on the Hackaday page and I'll see what we have next week. And we'll do another example and kind of grow our knowledge of, of components and develop more complicated um, scripts each time.